Putin has already lost this war. Hey, I'm Chuck Holton. Thanks for watching The Hot Zone. I'm in downtown Kiev today. You see that statue right there behind me? That says Lenin on it. They used to have a statue of Lenin standing there. Today, it has the symbol of Ukraine, that trident that we've all become familiar with since this war started about 17 days ago. I'm gonna make the case right now that Vladimir Putin has already lost this war. The Ukrainians have won. Whether or not Putin ends up taking Ukraine, taking down the government, installing a new one, whatever he thinks he's gonna do, it doesn't matter, he's lost this war. And here's why. I'm walking around downtown Kyiv 16, 17 days after the start of this war. As I mentioned before, captured Russian documents show that Putin planned to have this war wrapped up in 15 days, back when he first gave permission or signed the order to start this war, which was actually back on January 18th, according to those captured documents. And yet, Today, the streetlights are working. People are out shopping. There aren't that many people here, but they're out shopping. People are walking their dogs. The stores, the grocery stores are getting resupplied. The gas stations are getting gas. And this is in the capital city of Kyiv. So far, the Russians have managed to take a lot of territory, but it's almost all been territory that's out in the country not in the cities. So they've done very poorly every time they've tried to push into a urban or even suburban area inside Ukraine. The Ukraine's a gigantic country and it's the biggest country in Europe. And so here's some reasons why Vladimir Putin is losing. First, you have to look at his original uh, justification for starting this war. See, Vladimir Putin believes and has said publicly that he made the case on television. Look at this, there's a bus stop full of people right there waiting on a bus. Putin made the case on television that this war was necessary because number one, Ukraine is actually part of Russia. That's not only patently untrue, but it's actually backwards because Ukraine existed before Russia did. Kyiv was a city before Moscow was. And if anything, you could make a case that Russia is actually part of Ukraine. The Russo people began in Kyiv and they were the Kievan Rus, right? So that's his first uh, assertion is that Kiev is, or that, that uh, Ukraine is actually part of Russia. The second assertion is that Kiev is being run by neo Nazis. Now that's not true because while there is a very small, I'm talking very small, uh, neo Nazi faction in the far east of Ukraine, uh, it is not and has not been in control of Ukraine ever. Actually, they, from what I understand, they garnered less than 2% of the vote in the last election and won exactly zero seats in the parliament here. So yes, there's this Azov battalion in the east and they are fierce fighters and they have some members who are Staunch, staunch neo-Nazis, not good people. Uh, and those people actually rose in response to the, uh, in response to the, the invasion in 2014. So they're kind of a reaction to Putin's initial invasion here. Uh, so he claims that the whole country is run by those people. That's patently uh, untrue. 
not only that, but as many people have pointed out, the president of Ukraine is himself Jewish. It's kind of hard to say that guy's a Nazi. He, the president had family members who were killed in the Holocaust. He's not a Nazi. So that's patently untrue. Vladimir Putin has also said that Ukrainians are being brainwashed and held hostage by the West. And they're actually, uh, they, they, don't, they don't know what they're doing. They've been held hostage. And uh, it's, this, this is the jealous boyfriend argument. Uh, well, she, she says she doesn't love me anymore, but she really doesn't understand what she's saying. She actually does love me. And I need to save her from her own bad choices by kicking in her door and raping her. That's, that's essentially what uh, Vladimir Putin is saying here. I changed the camera back over to this side because I'm walking by City Hall right now. And there are a lot of fortifications uh, in the windows and doors. It's all sandbagged up, but they do not want me showing any of those fortifications and that's understandable. I get it. Uh, op operational security and all that, although it's uh, out there in the open for anybody to see. So his, his third assertion being that uh, Ukrainians are being held hostage by the West they don't know what they're doing. They've been brainwashed. Well, I think the Ukrainians themselves have put that idea to rest, especially since the start of the war. And the crazy and ironic thing is, Vladimir Putin has actually made that a self-fulfilling prophecy by being the jealous ex-boyfriend. When the jealous ex-boyfriend, you know, the, the girl breaks up with him because ah, he's a little unstable, I think. And then he goes on to prove her right by kicking in the door and, uh, you know, trying to rape her. Well, he just proved her point. So the fact that the Ukrainians want to move further to the West and move away from Russia is proven. I mean, they're, that the good idea of that is proven by the simple fact that Vladimir Putin just kicked in the door of their country and is trying to take it over by force. That typically is not the way that you win the hearts and minds of the people. So Putin actually believes all of this. I, I have no doubt. He is really convinced of all of these things. He's, he's a second rate history student. He believes his own propaganda. And so in his mind, it is an absolute imperative that he take over Russia. The last point that he's made is that the West wants to take over Russia. The West wants to attack Russia. And they're going to use uh, Ukraine as a bridge to do that. But you know what? The West doesn't need a, Ukraine as a bridge to do that. It's already got Lithuania. It's already got Latvia. It's already got Estonia. There are many countries that, that are, are touching Russia that are pro-Western, even NATO members. Uh, so there are 14 countries in the former Soviet Union that have already joined NATO. We don't need Ukraine to do that if, if that's what we wanted to do. And if you look at the past uh, 5, 10, 15 years under NATO, NATO has been declining in importance and value. And uh, members of NATO have been even refusing to fully fund their commitments to NATO because they didn't think it was necessary anymore. Like, if, Ru if Russia is not a threat, well, we're certainly not a threat to Russia. We're not planning on taking over Russia anytime soon. So why would we need to do that? But Vladimir Putin is convinced that NATO is planning 
to attack Russia, planning to take over Russia. So he had to take Ukraine in order to form a buffer between Russia and NATO. However, if he takes Ukraine now and, and swears that that's part of Russia, now Russia is closer to the NATO countries. He had a buffer. Ukraine was the buffer between Russia and NATO. And now, if he takes it, that'll no longer be the case. So every ar argument that Vladimir Putin has made for this invasion is complete and utter horse manure. There's just no other way to put it. And the problem is he has an army that's big enough to at least succeed in destroying this country, but he does not have an army that's big enough to hold this country. So yes, he might end up eventually taking over many of the biggest cities, Kharkiv, uh, Mariupol, Kherson, Dnipro maybe, even maybe this city where I'm right now in Kyiv. But he can't hold the whole country. And if he does take those cities, number one, it's gonna be unbelievably costly for him. It's already cost him a billion dollars a day in uh, his military campaign against Ukraine for 16, 17 days. But that's nothing compared to the sanctions. You take Russia, which is the, you know, a gigantic country, largest country in the world, but it only had a, a economy the size of Texas. Well, what do you think that economy is looking like now after all the sanctions that have been put in place on, on Russia? He, he just made himself the dictator of the world's largest third world country. The largest third world country on the planet is now Ukraine. I mean, is now uh, Russia. And it all didn't have to happen. So the long and the short of it is Russia has made it, this uh, winning in Ukraine a non-negotiable because Putin is done. If he does not succeed at this and do it quickly, he is done. There's, there, will, there will not be any more Vladimir Putin. Uh, he, he won't survive this politically and likely won't survive this, get out of this with his life. Uh, and the, at the very least, he'll be prosecuted for war crimes. Let's, let's look at the most likely scenario here. Like I said, Vladimir Putin cannot afford to lose in Ukraine, but he's already lost. And so he's becoming increasingly desperate. Desperate men do desperate things. He's bombing civilian centers. He's trying to terrorize the people into submission. His acts are doing exactly the opposite with the Ukrainian people. They're making the Ukrainian people more likely to fight back, more likely to stand up. People who were peaceable, who didn't believe in gun ownership, are now going out and getting themselves AK-47s and are training themselves and getting ready to fight. There's a waiting list for the military, uh, for the territorial guards here in Ukraine. You can't even join if you wanted to. They've had 66,000 Ukrainians come back to Ukraine in order to join the military and fight for their countries. Uh, I wonder if the United States was uh, invaded. I saw a poll yesterday that said that the majority of young people say that they would flee. Well, here in Ukraine, they're not fleeing, they're coming back. And not only that, there have been 20,000 foreigners, non-Ukrainians, who have come here and volunteered to fight for Ukraine because they understand that this is not a war between Russia and Ukraine. This is a war between Russia and the West. And if, uh, as uh, Petros Poroshenko, the former president, said yesterday when we in interviewed him, he made the point that if you think, if you in the West think that by not giving us fighter jets or not uh, closing the skies over Ukraine, that you are avoiding war with Russia, you're deluding yourself. You're just postponing your war with Russia because right now we are fighting them for you. 
But if we do not win, then you will be fighting them yourselves. That's essentially what he had to say when we interviewed him yesterday. So I want to make this point. I am walking around downtown Kiev in Maidan Square 16 days after the, 17 days after the invasion began. There are no explosions happening anywhere nearby. The enemy has not even, the, the Russians have not even penetrated the city limits of Kiev, except for in one spot in Brovary two days ago, out on the northeast side, and they literally lost an entire regiment of tanks doing so. I'm making the case right now that Russia does not have the manpower. They do not, even though they have got the second largest military in the world, they do not have the manpower and they do not have the materiel, the military equipment, to win this war. They do not. They can martyr the president here. They can destroy this city. They've got enough bombs to do that. All they will do is galvanize the will of the Ukrainian people to the point where they will be fighting an insurgency here on Ukrainian soil forever until the last Russian leaves this country and, and goes back to Russia. One more thing. The Russian people don't want this war either. The Russian people have risen up in spectacular fashion to protest this war, even though they're getting very little information about the war itself because of the uh, stranglehold that Putin has on the Russian state media. You have generals, you have airline pilots, you have uh, housewives, everybody is coming out against Putin and against this war. This is a failure tactically and strategically and politically for Vladimir Putin. The people who are suffering because of it are the Ukrainian people and the Russian people. We're seeing hundreds of thousands of Russians fleeing their own country now to get away from the sanctions and to get away from the threat of being uh, conscripted and sent off to fight in this useless and ridiculous war. It's, absolute, it's an absolute tragedy to see what one man's ego and delusion can do in the scale of human suffering around the world. The, the kind of suffering that, that we are seeing here in Ukraine. I mean, you look around here, it still looks like a beautiful European city. Other than the fact that there's no traffic and no, not, not a lot of people on the roads, you wouldn't even know anything's wrong. The odd, you hear the odd, you know, thunder roll off in the distance because the Russian troops are still fighting in the outskirts of Kyiv, uh, maybe 10 miles from where I'm standing. And, and large explosions, they'll carry that far. But here in downtown Kyiv, you wouldn't really know anything's wrong except for just there's not a lot of people out. And I think slowly but surely, this is going to drag on. Russia will likely resort to ever more brutal uh, tactics. Militarily, they are losing every time they face the Ukrainians. And so it's much easier to bomb civilian areas and tie up resources uh, with rescue efforts and things like that. But in the final analysis, there's, there's no pathway out of this for Vladimir Putin where he comes out a winner. There just isn't. And so I'm sorry that I have not been updating my podcast as much as uh, I normally do. I've been extremely busy here on the ground uh, with my live reporting for Newsmax. So you can go and watch me uh, at the, pretty much at the top of each hour on uh, NewsmaxTV.com. Uh, and, you know, just kind of see the day-to-day -day live broadcast there. Uh, if you're listening to my podcast, one of the reasons you haven't had much to listen to lately is because 
I'm doing more YouTube lives and putting videos up because everything we're doing here is so visual. Uh, it's really, it's lost, uh, just an audio. But uh, you can go and uh, look up the Hot Zone podcast on YouTube and find it there. And you can uh, watch it there. I, I highly recommend you do so. Also, if you want to support the podcast and support my reporting, you can go to chuckholton.locals.com and uh, you can subscribe there to get uh, sort of a lot of the extra background material that I'm consuming uh, because this is a big country and I can't be everywhere and there's a lot of uh, open source intelligence coming out that I'm following and so you might want to go follow me there and you can also uh, subscribe and uh, support the podcast that way that's one good way to do it I'm trying to give uh, the, the funds that are sent uh, to, to support the podcast, I'm trying to give back to Ukraine uh, every chance I get. There's a, I actually saw a homeless woman, the first one I've really seen in Ukraine uh, the other day. I don't know where she stays. It's very cold. But uh, I, I was able to give her, shoot, probably a month's salary uh, so that she could get something she could get something to eat and find a place to stay. I'm hearing rumblings off in the, on the northeast. That's near Brovery. The, the enemy sure, certainly has not given up. The Russians are, are still fighting. Like I said, they have to. They have to. They can't stop. They're throwing so many men into this. They've lost thousands of men already. They've lost over a thousand armored vehicles and tanks. They're, they are, are not doing well militarily at this, but they cannot stop because there is no way out of this except for them to essentially destroy this country, uh, unfortunately. So I would say pray for Ukraine. Pray for us as we seek to do the reporting that we're doing without putting ourselves at too much risk. Pray for the people. God bless you. Thanks for watching.